Good morning. God bless you on this wonderful day. My name is Brad Harvey, and I'm here to read the scripture for today. And since you're standing, I won't ask you to stand again. Uh, but we will be reading uh, the last two verses of Acts chapter 4. Uh, if you have a certain version of the Bible in the pew, it's on page 858. If not, it's probably somewhere close. So we'll start at Acts 4, 36 and read through chapter 5, verse 11. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she, and she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. May God bless the reading of your, his holy word. Thanks, Brad. You could be seated. Don't tell lies, or you might die. Let's close in prayer. Um, it's hard to know what to do with a passage like this, isn't it? You know, I mean, we've been singing these amazing songs and feeling really good, and then Brad read that passage, and it's like, wow, kind of a downer. Uh, this is a dark passage. Um, and there, there's a lot of that in scripture, but here's the thing about the scripture, and this is, this is hard, but it's so important. Scripture is very real. It's very raw. It deals with the real world and real problems, real humanity. Uh, here's Dr. Luke writing about the beginnings of the church. And if Luke was just writing as propaganda or you know, just trying to build the brand of the early church or market this thing as it's getting going, he wouldn't have included accounts like that, would he? He would have left that out. But the Bible doesn't leave stuff like that out because the Bible addresses real life and real people and the real ups and downs. So here we come to this very raw story and we're not quite sure what to do with it. Uh, maybe our gut reaction is, wasn't this a little extreme? You know, did they have to die for this? Uh, granted, it was uh, a bad decision. I've made a lot of bad decisions, and I'm still walking around, you know? Why, why in this case? And the more that I've contemplated this, uh, the more I really do see ourselves 
in Ananias and Sapphira. We are like them. We need to consider this very seriously because um, it shows us things about ourselves, and I think it really is relevant to us. You know, just back in chapter four, um, if you remember from last week, we saw uh, another description of just how awesome this early community of Christians was. Acts 4.32 says, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. The full number. That included Ananias and Sapphira, didn't it? They're part of that. No one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own. That included them. Verse 34 says that great grace was upon them all. Verse 33, sorry, upon them all. That includes Ananias and Sapphira. Like they're part of this amazing movement that was going on. And yet what we read about them in chapter five is they make this incredibly destructive decision and suffer the consequences for it. Well, how did that happen? I don't think it just happened like a knee-jerk, like snap decision on their part, right? That's not what happened. They didn't wake up one morning. What should we do today? Well, I was thinking we could lie to the Holy Spirit today. What do you think of it? That's crazy. I was thinking we should lie to the Holy Spirit today. Which lie should we tell? Like, that's not what happened. Something shifted, and there was some kind of path that they went down to get from here to there, wasn't there? So I want to think about that with you, and and although maybe there aren't specific details about all of their thought process and stuff like that, I think there are some clear implications in this text about how this happened. And one of the ways that I think we can uh, kind of decipher what's going on here is by realizing that the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 go together. Okay, so I think that the first step down this path for Ananias and Sapphira was comparison. I think this started because they compared themselves to Barnabas. At the end of chapter four, we read about Barnabas. He sold a piece of land. He gave all of the money to be distributed throughout the church community. And then we read about what Ananias and Sapphira did. And there's a chapter break there. But you know, the chapter breaks, those are not from God. We we humans inserted those just to kind of navigate the scripture, which is fine. But I would say uh, these two accounts go right together. Barnabas did this, but, chapter five, verse one, but, then here's what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Why did they cook up this scheme? Why did they feel like they had to give the impression that they had sold a field and given all the money to the church? Because that's what Barnabas had done. I don't think they even maybe worried about it until then. But here's Barnabas doing this and getting some notoriety for it, and so they're comparing themselves to him. And that's what we do as humans, isn't it? We compare ourselves to each other. And it's unhealthy, but it's just what we do. And scripture directly addresses this idea of comparison to each other. Uh, Let me just read a couple of those passages that deal with this. Um, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Paul is talking about other ministry leaders. Some of them are uh, his, his own critics. And he says about them, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. To compare ourselves to each other is to display a lack of wisdom, a lack of understanding. Or how about Galatians 6, 4? Galatians 6, 4. Let each person examine his own work, not somebody else's work, and how you might measure up to that or not. Not what Barnabas did. Let each person examine his own work and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. So here's the scripture urging us not to get into this trap of comparing ourselves with each other or measuring ourselves by somebody else. Why would the scripture have to exhort us not to do that? Because we do. It just comes naturally. And when we compare ourselves What happens next? Well, then there's this sense of inadequacy that we feel, right? So um, sometimes we'll compare ourselves to somebody where we look favorable, like, I'm not like this guy. 
But other times, if we're comparing ourselves to somebody that we look up to, or at least the people around us are looking up to that person, how do we feel? We feel inferior. Like, I can never be like Barnabas. We, look what he did. We haven't done that. And we've, we've all felt this way, right? We compare ourselves to each other and, and feel inadequate in so many ways. Maybe it's uh, like this, generosity. Wow, that person is so generous. I've never done anything like that. That person is so godly. I'm, I can never be as godly as that. Uh, wow, um, I'm trying to raise these children and it's hard. And look at those people's kids. They're just, you know, so well behaved and wonderful. It kind of makes me sick. Um, <laughs> We compare, right? And when we compare, we feel less than. And uh, sometimes it may not, we may not even know that we're feeling that, but you know what's a dead giveaway to that? You feel um, any like resentment towards somebody or frustration, criticism towards somebody, that's probably a sign that you're feeling, that you're comparing yourself to that person and you're feeling like you come up short compared to them. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, I, I would guess if we could overhear their conversations about Barnabas, they probably weren't saying how great Barnabas was and how much they look up to him and how much they wanted to be like him. They were probably more saying things like, ah, Barnabas, Blech. Why do people think he's so awesome, you know? He's, he's, he's not that awesome, he's an average Joe. Joe is his literal name. <laughs> and people call him the son of encouragement. I'm not feeling super encouraged right now by him. You know, I bet he came up with that nickname on his own, actually. He probably started circulating that. Like, these are the things we tell ourselves, right? We all do this. That shows a sense of inferiority. So we're comparing ourselves to other people and we don't measure up. And what happens next? The third step, I would say, is we get afraid. We get anxious. We have this fear. Because here's this standard that we're seeing somebody else meet, and we don't meet it, and now suddenly we're worried about that. And, uh, you know, I really, the more I think about this story, Ananias and Sapphira, I don't think they were necessarily greedy people. Oh, they kept back some of the money because they're greedy. Maybe not. Maybe they were in financially difficult straits and, and just weren't able to do that. I don't know. Uh, or maybe we think, well, they just wanted to be celebrated. You know, they just wanted the notoriety. Maybe. Or maybe they felt like that was the expectation that they had to meet. And they felt that pressure. We've all been there, haven't we? We feel these expectations. And I can't meet them. And I don't know what to do with that and it makes me very fearful of how I'm perceived by other people. Barnabas had done this and I think that Ananias and Sapphira felt this fear, this pressure like, oh, we have to do that too. Um, and you know, uh, a lot of times when we feel that pressure or we feel that these expectations are placed on us, it's in our own heads. Nobody actually, you know, maybe nobody looked at Ananias and Sapphira like, look what Barnabas did. He sold his field. Don't you guys have a field? What's going on? Aren't you gonna, like, maybe nobody even thought twice about that. But in their own heads, they felt that pressure from other people, maybe even from God. Like, God expects us, if we're gonna be on good terms with God, we have to do this. Fear. Fear. Um, I, you know, in, in recent years, I have reflected a little bit about, okay, wait a minute. How much does fear determine what I do? You ever done that? Like, wait a second. How much is fear a motivation for me? It is so prevalent, and we don't even know it. You know, there's a reason that the Bible says over and over again in, in various ways, don't be afraid. It's because we are afraid and we need to be reminded that we don't need to be afraid. But just naturally, we're so afraid of so many things all the time, aren't we? And it drives our decisions. I mean, at, at, at like this visceral core level, fear just drives so many of my decisions, I've realized. Like, okay, for example, um, people ask us to do things and we don't say no, do we? 
We do not say no or we don't want to say no. Um, we'll ghost somebody rather than say no. Why don't we, why? Like, why will we not say no to somebody? Uh, there could be some, some uh, amount of good motivation, right? Like, I want to be available, I want to, I want to help, I want to be sacrificial. But isn't there some fear of how you're perceived? Like, if I say no, I'm letting them down, they'll feel let down by me, they'll be upset with me, my reputation will be out the window, like, I don't know. It, it just doesn't feel right. We feel afraid to say no, even though we can't do everything. We have to say no to some things. Uh, As parents, how much fear do we have for our kids? I mean, we have fear, don't we? Um, How could we not? And yet, how much does that dictate what we do? Um, Helicopter parenting, that's, that's out of fear, isn't it? And there's, I mean, there's, there's a, a place for that. We, sh- we should be concerned. We should be protective. And yet, how much does fear drive us? Why do we uh, bring our kids to like 38 activities throughout the week and we're shuffling into all of that? Um, well, because we want to be a good p- parent. We want to give them opportunities. Yes, but aren't we afraid? Like, I have to do this. I have to give them these opportunities. If I don't do this, they might miss out on what their career path is. Their life will be ruined. What will other people think when they see that I'm not doing that? Like, fear. Fear. Uh, Scripture calls us to confess our sins and struggles to each other. Clearly. Why don't we do that? Because we're afraid. We're afraid of how that person might react or how I might feel as I'm opening up. We're afraid. So we compare ourselves to somebody. We, we fall short. That makes us afraid. Now what do we do? Well, this, this, was, this is the decision that was made. And it's, let's call it phoniness. What happens next when we keep going down this path? Well, what happens next is, all right, I can't live up to these expectations, but I'd better act like I can. I'd better project the impression that I can. That is exactly what Ananias and Sapphira did, isn't it? The problem, and this is really clear here, so, but let, let's, let's make sure we don't miss it. The problem with Ananias and Sapphira's decision was not that they kept some of that money. That was not the problem. Peter is really clear about that in verse uh, four. While your piece of land remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? You didn't even have to do this or act like you did it. Um, Wasn't it under your disposal? That's a word in the Greek that that has to do with authority. You had the authority, it was yours. You, you could decide what to do with it. So the problem wasn't that they kept some of the money, they didn't need to give it all away, they didn't even necessarily need to sell the field. The problem was that they acted like they had done all this stuff, projecting an image of themselves. Jonathan Pecluda says that the sin behind the sin And that's always important, isn't it? What's the sin behind it? Like, what's going on underneath? The sin behind the sin, he says, is perception management. That's an interesting term, isn't it? Perception management. This is something that we excel at as messed up human beings. Perception management. Here's the way I want to be perceived by people, even though that's not really me. That's how I want to be perceived by people. And so I am going to do what I can to make sure people perceive me that way, even if it involves being dishonest, being deceptive. And this is what Ananias and Sapphira were doing. They were faking it. Well, what happens when all of a sudden fear is driving you to live this lie this kind of phony front acting like you're somebody you're not well what happens next is isolation because if you are faking it and you are just working on perception management you cannot get too close to people can you if you do you will be exposed so you withdraw 
I mean, this is sad. In the last chapter, everyone was of one heart and one soul. Ananias and Sapphira, were, their, their hearts were knit together with the hearts of the other people around them. But you can't do that when you're being a phony. You have to pull back from that. So they're projecting this image and leads to isolation. That's really common, isn't it? I, maybe you've been there. You've been part of um, community, spiritual community, and you're going down a path that you know is not healthy, and what do you do? You pull back a little bit. You find reasons not to show up to church or with your friends or fellowship or when you do have to show up you're not you're not really there the real you is not really there because you're isolated to project that phony front and where does that lead it leads as we've seen to destruction this is a destructive path to go down and perhaps we are not being struck dead by the Lord, and yet, if we've gone down this path, we've experienced the destruction of it, haven't we? We've experienced death. Like relational and spiritually, we're, we're just dead inside when we go down this path. Uh, verse three is so intense. Look at verse three again. Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why has Satan filled your heart? You know, uh, um, one thing that we do as church people is we rank sins, right? These are the bad ones, and these are the ones that, you know, probably shouldn't, but not so bad, and we kind of have this hierarchy of sins. And there's certain sins that we would say, yeah, that's satanic. That's in a satanic, violent crimes. Um, maybe some sexual sins that we see as satanic. Um, you know, the really bad ones. Maybe like uh, being in the occult or those kind of practices, we'd say that's satanic. Well, what is Peter saying is satanic? This phoniness, this hypocrisy, this perception management, that is of the devil, he is saying. Because the devil is the father of lies. And what, 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 what are they doing here? They're living a lie. So like we all do, as I read this passage, one of my questions is why did they have to pay with their lives? You know, I don't think this was necessarily a, a, a worse sin or that they were worse people than any of us. So why did they have to pay with their lives in this case? Have you wondered about that? And, and I don't know the answer for sure, but you know, I think a lot of it has to do with here we are at the very beginning of the church and who the church is and what the church does is being established. And I think one thing God is trying to tell us is that this kind of phoniness and perception management is completely contrary to the gospel. Just think about that for a minute. Uh, think about if Ananias and Sapphira had continued to just project this image of themselves. Think if others had projected this image of themselves, pulled back, like we're not of one heart and one mind anymore, but we're, we're all protecting our images. And just, just imagine if that had infiltrated church. And maybe you've been in church where that's exactly what's going on. Everybody's just trying to appear better than they are. And what do we do? We get together and we act better than we are. And see you next week. And we'll all act better than we are again next Sunday. And it's like, what's going on? That's not... What the church is, the church is not a club. This is the people of God on mission to advance the gospel. And this kind of phoniness completely subverts the gospel. Uh, think about if you, uh, as church people, you want to give the world this message that forgiveness is available through Christ. Forgiveness. And at the same time, the way you carry yourself and the vibe you give is, I don't really need to be forgiven for anything. Or the message that there is a savior. There is a savior. But meanwhile, you kind of act like you don't really, you're not somebody that really needs a savior. Do you, do you see the contradiction there? Like, this is really important. 
I think God is trying to, to show us just how important this is, that at the core of the mission of the church is this idea that we do not have to fake it. Do we? we? As we've said, the Bible is a real book. It confronts the real problems of the world. Jesus came to deal with real humanity, fallen humanity. We don't have to act like we're not fallen. Jesus came to Forgive and redeem fallen humanity. So of all the people in the world, people who claim to believe this stuff should be the the least likely to be phony, right? Because our story is not look at me and look, look, look at I'm up to, our story is no, we all need a savior. And if we're gonna be fake, and if we're gonna keep things to ourselves, that subverts the gospel. Um, in verse five, After Ananias takes his last breath, it says, great fear came on all who heard it. Yeah, can you imagine? And then in verse 11 again, great fear after Sapphira's death came upon the whole church and all who heard these things. These these, these are things we need to take seriously. Maybe you're feeling a little of that right now, like, wow, okay, we gotta take some of this stuff seriously. So my question for us as we close is do we see ourselves on this path? Are we heading down the same path that Ananias and Sapphira were on? Do you find yourself comparing yourself to people or feeling that sense of I don't measure up to them and the fear that comes with that and putting on a front to protect yourself from that and then withdrawing from people so that you're not exposed and and maybe you're even experiencing like the death that comes inside from living that way. So if you relate to any of this or you see yourself on this path, The good news is you do not have to keep going down that path anymore. We can get off of that path. How do we get off of this path? And I just wanna suggest two very simple things, all right? If we see ourselves heading this direction, what are two ways we can get off this path? And it's simply to have a very honest conversation with God and with somebody else. Have an honest conversation with God. Um, It's so uh, sad to think that Ananias and Sapphira could have run to the Lord at any point in this process, couldn't they? Uh, When Garrett was praying, he was acknowledging that God is so eager to hear our prayers. He is so eager for us to come to, even more eager than we are to go to him. How good of a father is God and how gracious, how forgiving, how ready to help. At any point, they could have run to him. He would have received, he would have helped, but they, they no, they were determined to, to push God away and keep going down this destructive path. Pause and have an honest conversation with the Lord about where you're at with this stuff, what's going on inside of you. He is so ready to listen to you and care for you and help you in the middle of that. So have an honest conversation with God. Maybe the the prayer gathering that's happening right here tonight is an opportunity for that, for you. But then also have an honest conversation with somebody else. Somebody you know is for you. You know, somebody that you know cares about you. Somebody that's not gonna that come down on you and condemn you, but they're, they're going to help. Uh, when I read about this early church and the fact that they were so united, they were um, so intimate with each other, um, it makes me realize Ananias and Sapphira had help and support available from their community, and they did not take advantage of it. And that's sad. That's sad that they just kept pulling back and cultivating this lie instead of, I mean, they could have gone to somebody, couldn't they? There were probably lots of people who loved them and were ready to listen and help. And and I wanna propose there are lots of people here who love you and are ready to help if, if you will be courageous enough to come to them and tell them where you're at and that you need some help. 
You know, uh, Ananias and Sapphira could have gone to their small group. They could have gone to their discipleship groups. Is this a commercial to join groups? You bet it is. You bet it is. This is why we have them, right? This is why we have these communities is so that we don't plunge down these destructive paths. They could have talked about this. Wow, look what Barnabas did. I'm feeling this pressure like we're supposed to do that too. Is that, is that from God? Is that, where's that? Well, let's talk about that. Let's pray about that together. Or even farther down the road. You know what, guys? We've been acting like, because God did not, did you notice he didn't strike them dead immediately when they made this decision? It was, it was later on when they were in the temple and they told Peter. But that, that means they had lots of opportunities to come clean. Like, this is where we're at. We're actually, you know, we're sort of cultivating this reputation for having given all that money away. You know what? We didn't. And here's why. Or we feel bad about that. Or Let's talk about it. Let's pray about it. Let's work through this. Like, there was community there to help them with that, and they didn't take advantage of it. And there's community here to help you with whatever you're going through, whatever's relatable here to you. There are people here to, to help you and walk beside you. Don't do the same thing that Ananias and Sapphira did and just hold everyone at arm's length and don't receive that from them. Have a conversation with God and with somebody else so that instead of going down this path, you can find healing, you can find restoration. Let's pray together. We're reminded today, God, of our desperate need for you we're fallen people. Lord, if we're left to just our own thoughts and our own ways and our own strength, we just head down such a dark road. But Lord, thank you that with you there's deliverance and with you there's another way. There's forgiveness, there's redemption. Thank you for offering that to us, Lord. Lord, may we receive that from you. Lord, one of the ways you give us great support and help like this is through your people, our family. Lord, help us have the courage to receive that from each other as well. And as we do that, God, we pray that the good news of who you are and what you do and how you've overcome this broken world and our own fallenness, we pray that that message gets spread far and wide. In Jesus' name, amen.